Welcome to Two Bonded Books. My name is Janelle and this is a fiction in real life video. I haven't done one of these for a long time, but before I get into that, I just need to say I hope this goes well. Um, I've um, I've had a cold that I tur that I think turned into bronchitis. Um, and so if I end up coughing a lot, I might just give this up and try again later. But um, uh, we will see how this goes. Okay, so for my fiction in real life videos, what I do is I pair a fiction book with a nonfiction book about the same topic um, because I find that I find it really interesting to see how how they connect, how um, authors can use a, a true event or a real person and then tell a fictional story around that. This time I have the closest connection ever that I have done in a fiction and real life video. So for today's video I want to talk about the book Jack Shepard by William Harrison Ainsworth. This is the fiction book and then the non-fiction book I am pairing it with is Murder by the Book, The Crime That Shocked Dickens London by Claire Harmon. Okay, Jack Shepard was serially published in Bentley's Miscellany from 1839 to 1840 with illustrations by George Cruikshank. So it's a Victorian novel. Um, it is a historical romance and a Newgate novel based on the real life of the 18th century criminal Jack Shepard. So what's funny about fiction in real life is that the, the fiction book Jack Shepard tells a fictionalized story about the real Jack Shepard who lived in the 1700s. So we're already getting really uh, wrapped around things here. Anyways, the story is told in three parts called Epochs. Epoch the first is in 1703. Jack Shepard is born in Newgate where his mother is a prisoner on the day that his father is hanged. And then uh, it's a very dramatic opening to the story. Uh, there are two babies, there is a massive storm, there are criminals, there is a chase. It's, it's very, very exciting, the first epoch. Epoch the second takes place in uh, 1715. Jack Shepard, I think he's 12. When that starts, he is an apprentice to a carpenter. And then Epoch the third is in 1724. I really enjoyed reading Jack Shepard. Ainsworth's historical romances were always melodramatic over the top, but that's what a romance was in the Victorian time period. And I, I really did enjoy it. Um, I enjoyed the characters and the story and um, I just had a lot of fun reading it. Murder by the Book by Claire Harmon was published in 2018. Alison Weir said, I devoured it in one sitting and was at once enthralled and chilled. Um, from the synopsis it says, this is the fascinating story of a Victorian era murder that rocked literary London leading Charles Dickens, William Thackeray and Queen Victoria herself to wonder, can a novel kill? Here's a quote from the introduction. Early in the morning of Wednesday, 6th May, 1840, on an ultra-respectable Mayfair Street, one block to the east of Park Lane, a footman called Daniel Young answered the door to a panic-stricken young woman, Sarah Manser, the maid of the house opposite. Fetch a surgeon, fetch a surgeon, she cried. Her master, Lord William Russell, was lying in bed with his throat cut. So it was a very gruesome um, murder. Lord William Russell was the uncle to Lord John Russell, who was the Secretary of State for the Colonies. I'm going to read again from page 31. The murder quickly became the first topic of speculation across the city, from the bars and dives of Sofo Soho to Mayfair's clubs and salons where so many people had known the victim personally. Quote, For a considerable number of years, no event has occurred in the metropolis that has created a greater degree of excitement and consternation, the Times declared. Continuing, Then the tragical event which it now becomes our most painful duty 
to record, end quote. Hundreds of people had gravitated toward Norfolk Street, including several carriage loads of ladies waiting in the rain to catch whatever news emerged from the house. Lords Cowley and Ashburnham and the Marquess of Salisbury had been spotted in the crowd, and several members of the nobility had called in at the house, quote, for the purpose of making inquiries as to the truth of the rumors current concerning the murder, end quote. One of the rumors was that vast property had been stolen, for there had been some adequate motive. Oh, for there had to be some adequate motive. In his dressing room at the Haymarket Theatre, the great actor William McCready was annoyed to have his preparations for a performance of Hamlet interrupted by the bruit which is made about this poor old man's death. His Hamlet was just about the only serious play on in the city at the time, nine other theatres being occupied in competing stage versions of Jack Shepherd, a tawdry tale of thieves and cutthroats. At the other side of town, the painter, Benjamin Robert Hayden, had been having an excellent day in the studio for once when he heard the news. He'd been working on a painting called Highland Lovers, quote, never glazed better or more effectively, he wrote in his diary. Then, poor Lord William Russell has been murdered. A strange entry in one day. Charles Dickens, who was living nearby in Devonshire Terrace, must have followed the unfolding news with more than usual interest. He was writing a story, Barnaby Rudge, that begins with the brutal stabbing in his bed of the elderly Reuben Haredale by an undiscovered intruder. Life, it seemed, was imitating art. And at his desk in Great Coram Street in Bloomsbury, the young illustrator and journalist, William Makepeace Thackeray, was bothered by the noise of the new seller's cries outside. Quote, Here's a man shouting out, We shall have this Lord William Russell murder, he wrote to his mother. A nuisance, and so it is the stupid town talks about nothing else. End quote. Little did he realize how much more talk there would be in the coming months, nor how closely this crime touched his own concerns. So this was a murder that caused a huge amount of speculation and sensation in the city of London. And so in that last part that I read, they, they talked about Jack Shepard, the play. Nine different plays were on at the same time. They were all competing with each other about this story, Jack Shepard. So it, it was also causing quite the sensation. So just who is William Harrison Ainsworth? In the summer of 1840, the whole of London, from monarch to maidservants, was gripped by the unfolding drama in Norfolk Street. But behind it lay another story, a work of fiction and an ardent debate about the dangers of glamorizing vice and whether or not serious crime should be portrayed in fiction at all. If that year anyone had walked into the circulating libraries in the, on the Strand, or the bookshops along Piccadilly, or the gentlemen's clubs and reading rooms of Mayfair, and asked who was the most celebrated novelist of the day, he would have been as likely to hear the name of William Harrison Ainsworth as that of Edward Bueller, later Bueller Lytton, Thomas Lister, or Charles Dickens. Ainsworth was the golden boy of his generation, a charming and talented Mount Manchester lawyer who had moved to the capital in the 1820s in pursuit of the literary life, becoming at various times a journalist, publisher, editor, poet, playwright, and novelist. His literary heroes were Sir Walter Scott and Alexander Dumas, and Scott's praise of his first novel, a historical romance called Sir John Chiverton, very much helped launch the young Mancunian's career. He found other influential supporters in Thomas Campbell, editor of the New Monthly Magazine, Charles Lamb, the famous essayist, and John Ebers, editor of the literary souvenir and owner of the Opera House in the Haymarket, whose daughter Fanny, Ainsworth married in 1826 at the age of 21. It helped that as well as being clever, original, and quote, without a particle of conceit, Ainsworth was the only daz was also daz dazzlingly good looking. Quote, you see what a pretty fellow the young novelist of the season is, William Ma Magan wrote in Fraser's Magazine in 1834, opposite a specially commissioned portrait of the writer. 
how exactly, in fact, he resembles one of the most classically handsome and brilliant of the established lady killers, end quote. One of the best dressed, too. The dashing outline, this is a quote, of back, hip, thigh, leg, etc., etc., that Megan couldn't help noticing was set off in classic dandy fashion by beautifully tailored high-collared coats, tight trousers, jeweled pins, numerous rings, and a seemingly endless supply of gorgeously patterned waistcoats. <clears throat> the friendship between Ainsworth and Dickens and their popularity as writers. Ainsworth and Dickens met and they were friends for a short time and they were both very popular as writers at the same time. Although like this, that last section said, for a time, Ainsworth was definitely more popular than Dickens. Here is a quote from the book. Dickens' friendship with Ainsworth deepened in these two years. They were sharing ideas freely and even planning a collaboration, quote, to illustrate ancient and modern London in a Pickwick form, end quote. Ainsworth craved more of the Rockwood effect, that's another book that he wrote about a criminal, um, and knew how to get it. Quote, the truth is to write for the mob. We must not write too well, he told Crossley. The newspaper level is the true line to take. In proportion, as Dickens departs from this, he will decline in popular favor. Of this, I am certain. I think, however, he has so much tact that he will retrieve himself and become bad enough to suit all tastes. That's from page 53 in the, in the book. And I thought that was such a fascinating quote um, from Ainsworth and very interesting to think about at the time and then now when you think about um, their popularity now, Dickens versus Ainsworth. Here is another quote. So Ainsworth was in charge of the magazine as the gripping last episodes of Oliver Twist appeared in its pages and the first installments of his own, Jack Shepard, were published alongside them, embellished with Crookshank's arresting pictures. Quote, I trust it will be as popular as thrice lucky Rookwood Ainsworth wrote to Crossley, cheered by some praising early notices and very lively sales. He did all he could to promote the book, suggesting the anniversary of Shepard's execution on 16 November as the publication date for the free three-volume edition. Possibly the earliest instance of a publicity tie-in, which his friend Richard Harris Barnum felt, quote, should not be lost sight of in the advertisement. And that's from page 60 in the book. William Makepeace Thackeray had a definite response to what was going on. Quote, William Makepeace Thackeray watched the onslaught on Jack Shepard with some complacency since he had been attacking the Newgate novelists in print from the past six or seven years. And that's on page 63. So he had already been attacking what he called what were called Newgate novels, which were novels that romanticized criminals where criminals were the main character. And for a time, Newgate novels were very popular. Thackeray carried on a vigorous campaign against the Newgate novels, which seemed to him essentially fraudulent, romanticizing atrocious crimes in absurd and unreal ways and written by men who had no actual knowledge of the thieves and cutthroats they seemed so fond of describing. The public's moral weakness was exploited by such literature, he argued, but worse, the public seemed to prefer things that way. Quote, we are sick of heroic griefs, passions, tragedies, but take them out of the palace and place them in the thieves' boozing ken, be prodigal of irony, of slang, and bad grammar, sprinkle with cant phrases, leave out the H's, double the V's, divide the W's, as may be necessary, and tragedy becomes interesting once more." End quote. In a bold and bad move to counteract the trend, and perhaps make some money too, Thackeray had decided to write a Newgate story of his own that would deliberately disgust readers in order to produce, quote, a wholesome nausea and a more healthy habit, end quote. Writing under the pseudonym of Ike Solomon Jr., a deliberate reference to Dickens' source for Oliver Twist, he chose the worst case history he could find in the Newgate calendar, 
that of Catherine Hayes, who in 1726 had conspired with two men, one her lodger and lover, the other reportedly her illegitimate son, to murder her husband, a London carpenter. The three got their victim drunk and then murdered him with a hatchet, chopping the body into many parts and disposing of it in different locations, the head being thrown into the Thames. Thackeray had never written a novel before, but it's hard to see Catherine, published in installments between May 1839 and February 1840, as the beginning of a career leading to the brilliance of Vanity Fair only eight years later. Having chosen such a repellent tale, he struggled to keep control of the tone, bookending the crime with a heavily satirical prologue and a somber sermon-like postscript, both of which were guaranteed to bemuse readers rather than chasten them. And to keep his scheme, he felt obliged to include a description of the crime itself, which was so brutal and explicit that it was censored from later Victorian editions on the ground that it had, quote, no literary merit whatever, and was, quote, simply horrible. A dreadful irony that Thackeray would have torn his hair to know of. Interestingly, his plan did not work because his own Newgate novel was very popular and most people did not read it as satirical or in, in the way that he um, had intended. So I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, the play, Jack Shepard, which I've already said was being put on in nine different theaters simultaneously, nine different versions of the, the play. Here is a quote, Jack Shepard, have you seen, have you been to see Jack Shepard? These were the words on everyone's lips in the winter of 1839 as quote, constant crowds and starers, unquote, gathered round posters for the play. John Forster noted the phenomenon with mounting annoyance. Jack Shepard is the attraction at the Adelphi. Jack Shepard is the bill of fare at the Surrey. Jack Shepard is the choice example of morals and conduct held forth to the young citizens at the city of London. Jack Shepard reigns over the Victoria. Jack Shepard rejoices crowds at the Queens. And at Sadler's Wells, there is no prophet but of Jack Shepard. And that's from page 71 in the book. So, going back to the original crime, the valet in the house was arrested and found guilty, and his name was Cor Corvoisier, Corvoisier, I'm not sure how to say it. He was found guilty and sentenced to death, and here's a quote from page 142. Details from Corvoisier's confession were wildly, cir widely circulated in the newspapers and found their way quickly into ballads being sung all around town, like this one called Verses from F.B. Corvoisier now lying under sentence of death for the murder of his master, Lord William Russell. Pithy title. <laughs> Corvoisier claims to have gotten the idea for the murder from a book. Quote, the impetus Corvoisier now claimed came from quite another source. He declared and he wished the sheriff to let it be known to the world that the idea was first suggested to him by reading and seeing the performance of Jack Shepard. The book containing the history of Jack Shepard had been lent to him by one of the servants of the Duke of Bedford, and he lamented that he had ever seen it. That's from page 147. But if Corvoisier had been hoping to win sympathy for an appeal by offloading responsibility for his actions onto the year's most, most notorious youth corrupter, he seriously underestimated the power of moral panic. When a version of this was published in the Times on 26 June, it created a sensation. So much had been written about the contagion of Ainsworth's novel, so many column inches had been expended on quantifying the evil impact of the theatrical and the broadside versions and the shows at the Penny Gaffs, that the public had got used to seeing Ainsworth's book blamed for a sudden and steep increase in petty criminality, but having responsibility for a murder placed at its door took criticism of the book into another stratum as the examiner was quick to underline, quote, Corvus, Corvoisier ascribes his crimes to the perusal of that detestable book, Jack Shepard. 
and certainly it is a publication calculated to familiarize the mind with cruelties and to serve as the cutthroat's manual or the midnight assassin's vade mecum in which character we now expect to see it advertised. Ainsworth uh, wrote to the newspaper in, in response. He felt like he had to respond to this situation, to this public panic. On page 149, the explicit linking of the crime and his book had a predictably devastating effect on the author. But Ainsworth would have been unlikely to respond in print if the examiner hadn't made so much of the story in the week of its release. He had kept his distance from critics previously, but this onslaught was too public and too damaging to ignore. Affronted and offended, he sent the following letter to both the Times and the Morning Chronicle, claiming that the work mentioned by the murderer could not be his at all. And here's his letter. Sir, a statement to the effect that the assassin Corvasur is one of his reputed in one of his reputed confessions had asserted that the idea of murdering Lord William Russell was first suggested to him by the perusal of the romance of Jack Shepherd, and that he wished he had never seen the work, having appeared in the Times, I have taken means to ascertain the correctness of the report, and I find it utterly without foundation. The wretched man declared he had neither read the work in question nor made any statement. A collection of lives of noted malefactors, probably the Newgate calendar, had indeed fallen in his way, but the account of Jack Shepard contained in, his, in this series had not particularly attracted his attention. I am the more anxious to contradict this false and injurious statement because a writer in the Examiner of Sunday Last, without inquiring into the truth of the matter, has made it the groundwork of a most virulent and libellious attack upon my romance. Your obedient servant, your obedient servant, W. Harrison Ainsworth. Corvusor, I can't pronounce his name, uh, was found guilty and sentenced to death. And his execution was a huge event in London. Here's a quote from page 159. Francois Benjamin Corvusor, for all his affectations, was no criminal mastermind. He continued, however, to be a celebrity. In the week before his execution, the public gallery of Newgate Chapel was thronged with people who came to watch him as he knelt in prayer in the condemned man's pew. The sheriffs sold tickets for admission to the gallery, something they hadn't done for years. And on the Sunday before the execution, all the corridors of Newgate were full of people trying to get in, with a high turnout of aristocrats, including Lords Paget, Fitzclarence, and Bruce. Dickens, Charles Dickens, and a party of friends attended the execution. Here's a quote. They got to Newgate by 11 o'clock, but barriers were already in place and spectators camped out two or three deep to secure the best viewing places. Fascinated by the scene, Dickens led his party on a slow walk around the area as far as Smithfield, but all the time the flow of people going the other way toward Newgate was increasing. Burnet had to use his arms to make his way as if he were swimming against a tide. This was their first intimation of how many Londoners were gathering to watch Corvusser hang. Vast crowds at Newgate executions were commonplace. In 1806, 28 people died in the crush there. But this seemed completely out of the ordinary. Later, estimates, though they varied widely, agreed a consensus of around 40,000. The mass of people was alarming to behold and almost impossible to navigate through. Uh, it might now be said that we were no more in a stream but in a narrow river, Burnett recalled. As we neared the jail, we managed to turn aside and save ourselves from being overwhelmed. William Thackeray also attended the execution and he was affected by it for quite a while actually. Um, and then a further quote, uh, just to give you some context. 40,000 people was a lot of London at a time when the total population of the city was under 2 million. Can you imagine? That is huge. So what was the aftermath of all of this for William Harrison Ainsworth? The long controversy, this is from page 188, 
The long controversy about Jack Shepard did Ainsworth real damage. After Corvisser's confession, he was blackballed at the Trinity Club, and to add insult to injury, heard the news by letter from the man who had done more than anyone to shoot his novel down, John Forster. Quote, I regret much, my dear W.H.A., to be obliged to communicate to you the foregoing resolution. End quote. The Countess of Blessington jumped to her friend's support, offering to exert her influence to get Ainsworth into the Athenaeum instead, but he declined, partly out of pride and partly from practicality. The novelist had heard that he would get a cold welcome there. Having been given to understand that I should meet with formidable opposition from a hostile party, whom I must term the anti-Jack Shepardites, even to his formerly close friends, such as Dickens, had started to worry about books after Mr. Ainsworth's fashion. Richard Bentley, his publisher and proprietor of the magazine which had serialized Jack Shepard, suddenly lost faith in him and quarreled with Ainsworth bitterly, as a result of which the novelist and his illustrator Cruikshank left and set up the defiantly titled Ainsworth's Magazine, not half so successful. Ainsworth continued to write prolifically and profitably, but he never again chose a story with a criminal hero, and after Jack Shepard, his great fame was over. When John Forster mentioned Ainsworth's name in a letter of the 1860s, Robert Browning replied, Good heavens, is he still alive? So I find that so fascinating that you can go from such popularity and cause such a sensation uh, to, be, to being almost forgotten. His book still sold very well, but he never again wrote that type of novel, that type of Newgate novel. And Charles Dickens didn't either. His one and only attempt was Oliver Twist, and after that, he went on to write very different novels. However, he was smart enough to realize the popularity of that novel, and this is very interesting. Quote, Though he had distanced himself from the Newgate phenomenon, Dickens was as alert as anyone to its power, and in his late career, when his highly dramatic public readings from his novels became popular, The Murder of Nancy was the episode he performed most frequently. It became something of an obsession with him, and he threw himself into his impersonation of Bill Sykes with excessive zeal, bringing on a collapse after one performance in January 1870 that is thought to have hastened his death four months later. Quote, my ordinary pulse is 72, he wrote to his friend Wills after the reading, and it runs up under this effort to 112. Besides which, it takes me 10 or 12 minutes to get my wind back at all, end quote. But Dickens was gripped by the most sensational scene of his most Newgate novel, drawn to its vitality and visceral appeal as ardently as anyone in the pit. Few writers of his age knew better what an audience wanted. So there you have it, uh, Murder by the Book by Claire Harmon. If you've never read Jack Shepard, it is definitely worth reading it if you're also going to read this book. You don't have to to fully enjoy this book, but I think it really it really enhanced my own experience to know exactly what was going on at the time period and what the author here was talking about. I think it's so interesting because this kind of debate is still going on today. Um, does the... Um, the plot of books affect our own actions? Is it worthwhile to read, I don't know, let's call it trash? Um, we still have these debates and discussions today and these kind of books still cause sensation in the news and um, online. And so I think it's, it's interesting to think about and it's worth considering the fact that even you know, hundreds of years later, we are still drawn to these kind of stories because horror, mystery, um, those kind of books are still hugely, hugely popular. And it's now very common to have books written from the killer's perspective or from the perspective of, of the bad guy. You've got the, the noir books um, or the hard-boiled books of the 30s and 40s 
where the main character is morally gray, we are still really attracted to these kind of stories. And so I find that very, very interesting. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in another video soon.